Hey everyone and welcome back to the channel. In this week's video we get to explore a complete Tudor time capsule. Going back in time to the 15th century, the story with Gainsborough Old Hall starts with a powerful charismatic character named Thomas Burr. Starting off as a soldier, as a Yorkist in Edward's army, Thomas was knighted when Edward was crown king and rewarded for his loyalty with land throughout Lincolnshire, including here at Gainsborough Old Hall. This hall is over 500 years old and one of the best preserved medieval manor houses in England, so why not join us for a wonder? The first room, and for us, the first wow moment that we get to enjoy is the incredible Great Hall. It was built in the 1460s and really is a masterpiece of 15th century timber construction and craftsmanship. The sheer size of the hall is monumental. You can see just how it would have looked set up for the Lord and his family at the top of the hall whilst they were waiting for their grand feasts, with their plates and trophies placed next to his seat, showing off his royalties and achievements for his guests to be impressed by, as well as having the room covered in beautiful tapestries and painted ceilings all around him. We then see the unusual function of the Oriel Bay window at the east end of the Great Hall. It was inserted around the late 16th century and more than likely came from a dissolved monastery. As with many other castles and historical buildings, the Great Hall is the practical and social heart of the manor. It was used for entertaining, eating and carrying out the administrative functions of the estate. This hall really is up there with one of the most beautiful that we've seen to date, giving quite a few of the other places that we've seen a run for its money. The architecture is super interesting and it's amazing how well built the hall still is. There are so many incredible features that are worth taking the time to look at. Just at the end of the hall, a timber screen which has since disappeared partitioned off the West Bay from the rest of the chamber. This was known as a screen's passage, and like mentioned, it doesn't actually exist anymore. But behind the screen and inside these three doors, it gave access to the buttery, the pantry and a service passage that led directly to the kitchen. In 1460, Thomas began to build a magnificent family home, a sign of his growing wealth and status. From that point on, Sir Thomas stayed close to the Yorkist cause, rescuing Edward when he was held hostage by the Earl of Warwick, then transferring allegiance to Richard III on the death of Edward, attending Richard's coronation and even fighting for him at Bosworth. But when Henry VIII took the throne in 1485, there was Sir Thomas very much in favour and ready to become a Tudor through and through. We take a wander through the passageway and head up to the West Lodging Range. This three-storey timber-framed range was built primarily as a lodging block for the Burr household and its guests. Over the centuries it housed wealthy dignitaries, housed the senior members of the household servants and even sheltered the poorest families in Gainsborough. The structure originally consisted of 12 near identical rooms, each with a fireplace, but it also may have served as nine discrete suites of rooms of either double or single chambers that would have been able to provide a range of space to suit the various roles and of course statuses of the residents and visitors that actually needed this space. The design of the medieval lodging range is very similar in layout to our now modern day hotels. What we found quite odd is, with the age of this home, the stairs and floors almost seem uneven and warped, so it was quite odd to walk on. After the Hickman family moved out of the property in around the 1730s, a series of wash houses were built over a main drain at the base of the west wall. These served the range's two upper floors and possibly also acted as a commercial laundry at the time. 
Later, in the 18th and 19th centuries, the upper floors would have been rented out as lodgings, and the ground floor then occupied by a series of businesses. Whilst the two side ranges of Gainsborough took on a multi-occupancy, multi-functional role, the Great Hall continued as a place of gathering, occasion and performance. John Wesley preached in the chamber and the yard outside on a number of occasions, through the 1780s. Then, in 1790, the Great Hall was leased as the new theatre for the town. Extensive changes were made to the medieval space, with a stage created where the day has been, and the walls lined with brightly painted theatre boxes and a gallery constructed at the West End. The range of performances included dramatic productions, musical entertainments, lectures and public ceremonies. Now on to perhaps the most impressive part of this beautiful building, the incredibly unique and interesting vast kitchen. This happens to be one of the largest and most complete to survive from the Middle Ages. It dates back to Thomas Burr II's final building campaign, in the 1480s, but it's something that I've personally never seen before, still standing as it would have done all of those centuries ago, when the cooks and servants would be cooking up a storm. Firstly, you're drawn to the huge open hatchway as you walk inside which was a serving and dressing hatch. This was when the meals would be finished here on a dressing board, to then be plated and ready to be taken into the hall for the Lord's acceptance. Just next to the hatch is what's known as the dressing office, with its two doors, one overlooking the kitchen side and one overlooking the hatch side and seated inside was the clerk who kept accounts of all of the supplies coming and going and all of the dishes going out. Overseeing the whole process from a gallery in the west wall and over the ovens was the head cook whose chamber was in the northwest corner over the boiling house. This was reached by the ladders. This space offered the head cook warm and relatively private accommodation. The kitchen was the lead focal point for food preparation in the hall. This room was supported by a series of subsidiary buildings, including stores for foodstuffs and fuel, with a bakehouse, a brew house and a dairy, even including a smithy and other facilities that would ensure efficient food supply for its household of around 50 to 100 people at a time, or more if the Lord decided to entertain some guests. Nevertheless, the kitchen was always very busy and extremely hot. In the Middle Ages, in the bustle of the morning rush, the kitchen would be predominantly a male environment, each with clearly defined roles, and a structure would be followed to ensure efficient production day in and day out. Two wide halves dominate the kitchen. One was for stewing meat and making thick soup, the other was the roasting hearth and it could house 12 foot iron spits. These would have had massive beasts on them, turned slowly by young boys crouched in the shallowed niches on each side to ensure that the meat was cooked evenly. Drip trays would be placed beneath the meat so it could be used as valuable fats used for cooking. It truly does give you an excellent glimpse into daily life of the Tudor Manor. It's easy to imagine the hustle and bustle of the servants preparing meals for lavish feasts, all doing their part and working together, all in order to keep their lord happy. On one of Henry VIII's visits to Gainsborough, he brought along his fifth wife, Catherine Howard, but later she was accused of being indiscreet while she was there, and then again in nearby Lincoln, and unfortunately for her, it was a case of off with her head. So here lonely Henry, on the lookout for another queen again, and Catherine Parr came to mind. Making our way towards the east range of the house, we walk up the Newell Stair that was built by Thomas II's great-great-grandson, 
also named Thomas, who added a enclosed stairway and gallery in the northeast corner. This basically gave access between the Great Hall and the private quarters of the East Range. Thomas IV's stair was centred on a huge newel post that rises to a wide self-facing first floor gallery, with lovely large windows to gaze out across uh, towards the town. The gallery chamber was off the newel stairs and it was near enough likened to a solo room, an upper room at the high end of the hall that provided more private withdrawing space for the Lord and his family. What I liked about this room is how elegant and interesting that it would have once been decorated, with wall hangings and a large fireplace to keep them warm, but it was also a secluded space where they could not be disturbed by the crowds below. The two first floor rooms in the northern half of this east range formed into a bridge between the public arena of the Great Hall and the fully private spaces of the tower. In the mid 19th century the rooms were joined to form a single large chamber. Originally the Great Chamber had served almost as a second, more intimate private hall where only the Lord could dine with his family members and receive special guests or those lucky enough from the household staff to get an invite. And the high status of this room is more than likely indicated by the elegant posts in the corridor outside. Whilst the great chamber had a semi-public role, the chamber beyond allowed the Lord to fully withdraw. It was suggested that the decoration of this great chamber were filled with incredibly rich interiors, richly dressed and large fireplaces, carpets and paintings with tapestry showing off their great wealth. The two of the chambers served similar purposes over the rolls when the Hickman owners were here between 1596 and 1730. And over the winter of 1848 the two medieval chambers were remodelled into a single assembly room for the town. An existing ceiling in the smaller chamber was raised and then replicated across the great chamber. The walls were lined with studwork and plastered and the current rows of gorgeous chandeliers were hung, making it look extra elegant and beautiful. Off of the hall you can enter the sophisticated three-storey brick tower at the northeast corner, which is in contrast to the timber-framed ranges. The tower itself is a self-contained building, with its own entrance and stair. Its main body is octagonal, with each of the three storeys containing a single chamber, complete with a fireplace and a latrine, which you can see and a spiral stair that links each room. From the top you're met with a rooftop view across the River Trent and to the fields in the north. In our visit we didn't actually go up on camera, but if you do get the chance it's completely worth it and it's absolutely stunning up there. The final rooms that we managed to visit were reconfigured in the 17th century. William Hickman created a main chamber and a side closet on each of the three floors, while still keeping the 15th century two-storey corridor arrangement. The upper level was actually used as a nursery, and the mid-level was used as his own bedchamber. It's amazing to see around the large chamber. It was well lit by three wide windows and a stone fireplace heating the rooms. Sir William also had a curtained four poster bed, along with a jewellery cabinet that contains some of the finest diamonds, pearls and rubies. Later in the 1890s, most of the East Range seems to be leased by Frederick Baines, an auctioneer who rented part of the Great Hall for his stock and his auctions. He was also the caretaker of the Masonic Lodge, which by 1896 occupied the main ground floor space of the Eastern Range. 
Frederick and his wife Anne lived in the southern suite of rooms, using Sir William's old bedchamber as their sitting room. The largest of their ground room chambers, the Baines used for their dining room. Sir Thomas held the hall and his lands. He was named the first Lord Burr in Gainsborough of 1487 and kept connections to the royal family for the rest of his life. He even hosted Henry VIII on several occasions. And then things got even closer. Thomas's son and successor, Edward, was married to Catherine Parr. There really is plenty to see and to keep you occupied here. A visit here is a true glimpse into Tudor life, a glimpse into the treasure that has been beautifully kept throughout the time and echoes its history throughout its walls. We would 100% encourage you to put Gainsborough Old Hall on your list for a visit. They also have a lovely cafe inside and an English heritage souvenir shop to remember your visit by. So if you've enjoyed our video, please be sure to click the like button, consider subscribing to the channel and even consider having a look through some of the ways that you can support us here on the channel so we can continue doing these videos for you. All of the links are down in our description. We want to say a big thank you to our Patreons and to our channel members for their kind support. So we'll see you in the next one. Till next time.